Hi, I'm Andrew McCray. Welcome to our farm and ranch in Northwest Missouri. My great-great-grandfather settled here in 1910, and I'm the fifth generation to grow crops and livestock here. As a farmer myself, I know the highs and lows of this life, the issues we confront every day, some new, some as old as farming itself. This show is a place to talk with farmers and others in the ag industry about topics that mean something to us, topics that can improve the present and future of our operations. This is Farming the Countryside. Ryan Lepp joins me, and Ryan is the Global Combine Marketing Manager for CNH. And we're going to be talking about uh, harvest, which, of course, is already here for some folks, coming up for others. Ryan, thanks, first of all, for joining me. And, and maybe before we dive into things, tell people a little bit about your background, because with your title, it sounds like that you handle uh, quite a bit when it comes to combines. Yeah, that's that's right, Andrew. Just, just uh, yeah, again, my name is Ryan Lipp, and I'm the Global Combine Market Manager for CNH. And uh, particularly on harvesting products and combines. And um, really, I'm just really just helping with a lot of the marketing, you know, campaigns and advertising and doing things like this, uh, helping with demos and and farm shows. Uh, we got, you know, Husker Harvest going on this week. And um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of lot involved with here uh, with this uh, position. So. It's a lot of fun, you know, with harvesting. To me, I, I've been with the company for about 24, a little over 24 years. And most of it's been with combines from engineering to product support, product specialist, and now into the marketing role. So, um, yeah, it's it's fun. Harvesting is a great product. Combines are fun. I think they're the best product, in my opinion, the best product in the farming uh, community, I think. So, <laughs> right, right. So, well, and we're going to have a conversation about combines and certainly you, you know, you're with the CNH uh, brand there, but we'll talk about things that cover in a yeah. sense, all brands, uh, some are specific yeah. uh, depending on what you have. Uh, before we, you know, maybe get into some specifics, I'm curious, what kinds of calls are the ones that you're getting this time of year as people are heading back out to the field? Is there any one certain type of call that you're, that you tend to get this time of year? Oh, you know, you know, being at the Husker Harvest, you know, just, uh, you know, what some of my settings should be, uh, some of those things that are guys are looking at, what should I, how can I improve from last year? You know, just some very basic settings. A lot of guys are just uh, trying to go through and trying to remember, you know, a lot of these guys are using their combine one, maybe two months out of the year. And it's, it's helpful just having a refresher, uh, you know, what are, what should my settings be? And a lot of it also is, you know, the technology and, you know, what, as far as data, yield data, calibrations on the combine, um, those are some of those very basic questions. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really what we're, what customers are looking for is kind of a refresher course and get sure. their machines get well. Right, right. So as we get into this, you know, I, you know, I farm in Northwest Missouri. I think about our own combine. When I get into it, I have my sheet and my cheat sheet from years past of you yeah. know where I set yeah. things is that the place for me to start uh, is just what I did last year or do I need to, to rethink how I do it because writing things on the back of an envelope or putting it in your phone works but I don't know if it's the best way to, to start out the season and setting the combine yeah it you know it's a it's actually a good place to start and of course every year it's just a little bit different you know I live in uh, southern Minnesota and we had a lot of rain here early in the season and it turned into another 10,000 lakes. And so there's a lot of drowned out areas in the field. So there's going to be a lot of up and down. So that's going to maybe make some tweaks to our, some of our settings, um, whether it's rotor speed or rotor concave clearance. And, uh, but you know, as far as cheat sheet going from year over year, it's, it's not a bad place to start and then work from there. And, uh, you know, we, we've got in our systems, we've got automatic crop settings where you can save your settings from the previous year and then carry them forward so that you can uh, have a good place to start with from last year. So that's integrated or built into the technology, into the combines and a lot of combines and a lot of manufacturers have this feature. So it is a good place to start. 
So maybe I should ask then, if it is a good place to start, how do I know that what I have done in the past is the best way to do it? How's my best way to begin to check and make sure, okay, this is set right? And I know there's so many things that we can walk through at this yeah. this point, uh, but where do I begin? Right. So I, you know, when I when I do customer clinics, I start at the beginning. Start at the beginning, the front of the header. Uh, start with the header. I'm looking at things where where my settings for my on the cord head for example. My deck plates, are they in good shape? How are the gathering chains, the sprocket, the drive sprockets? Um, where is my deck plate gap? You know, as far as uh, where where that setting should be, whether it's an inch or inch and an eighth, um, that's that's a good place. You know, to be looking at stuff on the head and the bean head, looking at my cutter bar, making sure my flotation is good on the cutter bar so that it floats really nice on the uh, throughout the terrain of the ground and uh you know just kind of working your way through back on the feeder house am i looking at my feeder drum should be what position is my feeder drum is it in the middle of the high position if i'm running a draper head i typically run the dr uh, uh, that drum the feed drum on the highest position so that i get enough crop flow through underneath the drum um looking at the feeder chain you know how how tight is it is there some wear on it um you don't want it too loose but you don't want it you know, too tight where you're wearing down on the, on the spur drive sprockets. And so you're just kind of falling through with the feeder house. Um, the, you know, it's the latch, the feeder latch is a good place to, you know, make sure my latch is a good shot, good shape. So when I attach the header to the, to the combine that it's, it's a positive latch and it's secured, uh, hydraulics and my electric connections, when I hook those up, making sure that they are connected very well, they're clean, um, no debris or anything on the connections. And, you know, just working our way back through the combine. And, um, you know, if I, once I get my, you know, one thing I look at is calibrations. When I'm, before I'm starting is calibrations, right? That's, that's a big thing. And that's questions I get from customers is, you know, what should I be looking at to start? And calibrations are very important. And one of them is my sieve calibration. You know, I want to make sure that my number that I'm reading in the cab is the same actually the same in the physically the same at the sieves and that's both for your top and bottom sieve so i want that number to be same so when i'm reading in the cab it's you know it's right on so that calibration needs to be done before harvest and making sure i do that and real simple a lot of manufacturers it's it's pretty simple and quick you go back there and measure it and then go up and do the calibration in the cab and and run through the run through it on the on the display and uh, the other thing is concave clearance. You know, that's a calibration that needs to be done. Very crucial on how we thresh and how the job it does, making sure we're doing a good job of threshing, getting the corn off the cob or, and getting our, our beans, knocking all the beans off the pods and doing good jobs and, that, and making sure it's not cracking, you know, making sure that it's a good sample. So, you know, threshing, sieves all the way through and back all the way back to our residue, making sure our residue, uh, you know, it's deflectors or the spinners, making sure they're in good shape and nothing's cracked there, you know, physically looking at it. So let's walk through a few of those things. Just thinking from my own experience and what I hear from others, I'll go back and, and we'll work through the way you did uh, starting up at the head and thinking about corn. How should I think about getting that, that stock through that header? Because a lot of times we play around with the speed and the heights and so forth. How should I, what is the optimum, I should say, when I'm trying to get that, that corn stalk through that header and, and get that ear off? Yeah, so as, that, as the header is pulling, or I should say the stock rolls, as the stock rolls are pulling that, that stock through the stock rolls, you want to make sure that that ear kind of lands right in the middle of the deck plate. So right, you don't really want it to land at the at the upper end of the deck plate or getting it torn off at the very front of it. So that goes back to the speed, the feeder speed. And a lot of combines, you know, obviously have feeder speed, uh, have adjustment. You can vary the speed, and that's where it comes down to because you want really you're you're after the right feeder speed to match your ground speed, right? So you're just making sure that that hey, I want to drive at you know, whatever, four mile an hour. And at four mile an hour, I might probably want a 570 uh, feeder speed and which translates to what the stock roll speed is going to be. And that's, you know, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to try and match those two speeds, make sure that that ear lands right in the middle of that deck plate so that it gives it a chance to, 
carry up the deck plate up the rail unit into the auger trough. And, and obviously you don't want it to any plugging, you know, sometimes different conditions. If the stock is a little greener, you know, you want to make sure that that stock gets pulled all the way through rather than getting waiting until it gets pulled through at the back of the deck plate. So then if that happens, you know, that then you're, you know, start to plug, you start to hairpin back there. That's telling me that my feeder speed is probably just a little bit too slow. So I'm going to want to increase that feeder speed. You mentioned deck plates there earlier as well. I hear all types of different theories on what you should do with those deck plates. Should I set yep. them to begin the year and leave them, or should I be adjusting them uh, based on the on the day or so forth? And and depending on the combine you have and the header, some are yep. easier to move than others. Uh, sometimes it takes a lot of work to to change those. Yeah, I mean, with all the different uh, head manufacturers out there, where it's self adjusting or hydraulically moving those deck plates, it's a good idea to keep an eye on that. I. I've been in field conditions where the deck plates are not set right. And I tell you what, when they're, when those are not set right and, and you're in Missouri, you probably have some dry corn that dry little drier than we, up here in Minnesota, where, um, you know, if it's 15, 14% corn, that, that ear is going to shell off a lot easier. And if those deck plates, you know, are not quite set right, you're going to have a lot of head loss. So it's very important set that deck plate you know i'll just give a number out there you know we want to set that right around an inch inch is a good and that's the distance between the two deck plates and you know a lot of times i'll take a socket hey i got i got a inch socket or a seven inch socket and i'll use that as kind of a gauge and go through and mainly just uh, make the adjustment so that when i'm once i got that manual adjustment set then when i go and adjust the hydraulically it's i know it's going to be right so then I'm going to make sure that, you know, and it's a good, good place to start. And if I'm drier corn conditions, if it's, if that stock is obviously is thick of a stock, you know, then I'm going to have to narrow that deck plate up. Um, if I have too, if I have it closed off too much, you know, you're going to bring a lot more stock and a lot more mog leaves into the combine, which is going to reduce the capacity of the combine. So, so it is very important. And then we can start talking about down corn too. So it seems like there's down corn every place, uh, you know, every year there's places that wind just gets after it. So anyway, that's, that's a whole other adjustment too, whether it's header angle, um, boy, I go into a lot of that. So, <laughs> yeah, well, and whenever I've, I've had to deal with that, it doesn't seem like there's any one good way. I mean, you just begin to right. attack it from... <laughs> <laughs> Unless right. you've got some great tip to tell me what to yep. do, it seems like it just varies so much. Yeah, I you know if you're in down corn, you know, or gooseneck corn where that stock is over and out, maybe you know, or if it, let's just say it's down, and you really you want to get that snow down low enough and pointing down so that as you're going through the field, it it can pick up that stock, just give it a little more lift and pick it up and bring that into the head. And that's really idea. That's what you're after. Um, so deck plate angle, I talk a lot about, you know, header angles um, on the deck plates. What I do is take an angle finder and put it on the deck plate. And I'm typically right around that 22 to 23 degrees. And that's lowering the head down to where your, your cut height is, right? So then I'm going to take that angle finder and I'm going to put it on that deck plate. And that should be 22 to 23 degrees. And that's generally... You know, whether across manufacturers, that's a good place to start. And a lot of our combines today, the newer combines have a feeder face adjustment. So we can do that from the cab, uh, which is really nice. But if you don't have that option, it, there's a manual adjustment where the feeder face, is, uh, feeder, uh, face plate is adjustable with bolts on the side of the feeder house. And you can change them uh, to get that angle, to get that 22, 23 degree angle. But generally, that's a that's a pretty good place to start. But again, if you're in some down corn, you may have to tip that forward just to get that snout a little bit uh, underneath that stock. But again, a lot of corn headers, uh, many factories, they have adjustment actually on the snout itself. So then, you know, maybe I'll put that down so that I can get that underneath that stock and pick that stock up. So, um, yeah. So there's a few adjustments there. <laughs> Let's move back through the combine then. We mentioned, uh, touched on earlier there about concave setting and just looking at how this crop is is threshing there. 
Yep. You know, other than me looking at what's going in the bin, how's my best way to determine, okay, I'm too tight, I'm, I'm too loose through here. Any tips on and how I should set that and what I'm looking at visually to, to do the best job of threshing the grain? Well, in so let's just take soybeans, for instance. And, you know, we have a lot of guys growing seed beans, right? And what I usually typically do is get going in the field, I'll close those concaves up to where I'm getting all the pods knocked out and mean threshed out and i will close that concave up to the point where it starts to i start to see a little bit of cracks then i'm going to relax those concaves back off just a little bit to where i'm not seeing the cracks and so that's kind of a, a general a rule or a typical way how i can how i can set the comma as far as um making sure I'm, I'm doing a good job of threshing but not cracking as well and in corn you know, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're you're looking at the sample, and sometimes it's hard to gauge on the window, the grain tank window, because as the grain tank is filling up, all the fines, everything runs right to the window first. And sometimes you got to be a little, you got to be a little uh, cautious of that and, and aware of that, and say, hey, you know what? What does it really look like if I stick my hand in the grain tank? Well, it, you know, just look at it and and say, hey, you know what's is there a lot of fine? There's a lot of cracks and brokenness. So then I might have to back off that concave clearance as well as rotor speed. Rotor speed obviously has a lot of effect on, on throughput, but uh, as well as grain damage as well. So, but I'm really looking at that, just making sure that um, it's doing a good job between those two settings. <laughs> Then back at the sieves, I always hear lots of comments about what, how how open they should be. They should be totally closed. I think everybody has yep. a theory. That, yep. uh, so I'll ask you, uh, what's the right way uh, to set those? Well, yeah, that's that's a good question. Good point. Um, you, you know, I a lot of questions. In the old the old days, you know, a lot of uh, folks would close that bottom sieve down, right? Especially in soybeans, and let's close that sieve, bottom sieve down and. And if you're getting some hard thresh beans and you're trying to get those beans knocked out, you know, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. Um, but uh, really, what you're really after is looking for airflow. And one thing you have to be careful, if you're closing those bottom sieves down too much, you're affecting your airflow from the cleaning fan through the sieve. So that really controls a lot of your, your pattern, your air patterns through the sieve. You want to keep that mock suspended as much as you can to get it out of the out out of the combine and really what you're doing is gonna you're gonna be uh opening up that bottom sieve i like to run the bottom sieve but uh, in my from my experience i like to run that bottom sieve just a little more open than the top sieve actually and if i'm doing a good job threshing um that's key and if you're doing a good job threshing you know i'm then i'm not gonna have to worry too much about the returns because i'm getting all grain knocked out of the out of the pods um or getting the grain off the cob uh, corn out the com. So I like to run that bottom sieve a little more open so that I get a good air flow through the sieves and keep that chaff and that mock suspended to get it out of the combine. So that's really, that's really what I'm after and looking for. Um, and that top sieve, you know, if I'm getting bits of cob in the sample, let's say, you know, really then what I'm after is maybe I'll, I'll try with the, the concave and rotor speed first. And if I'm in a certain variety, say, hey, you know, it's it just that cob is just breaking up just a little bit too much. I got to get it out. Of the, I want to get it out of the, the sample grain tank. So then I'll probably have to use the top sieve and just close that down just a little bit to help sift out and uh, get that cob out. So that's, you know, that's there's a lot of things to it, but you're right. It's, there's some good questions on that. When I walk behind the combine, uh, I guess we don't want to see any grain on the on the ground. Right? How yeah, do right. I evaluate? How do I evaluate what I'm seeing? Not only uh, grain, but also then what I'll say the the trash that I'm throwing. How's the best way to evaluate when I'm out there walking behind the combine? Yeah, so you're looking at losses, right? So you're getting out and and get out of the combine and look after you uh, um, harvest in an area. So you go along and you and you stop the combine and. And first thing I do is look at the header. That's sometimes you know, a lot of guys will, will miss is the header. How, if I'm using the corn head, how much header loss is there? And and even before that, you know, is there any field loss, pre-harvest loss, right? So if there's any, you know, wind damage or whatever, hail, yeah, you know, how much loss is there before I even start harvesting the crop? 
So then I'm looking at that, and then I'm looking at the com line, or uh, sorry, the header. And I'm looking underneath the header um, before, when I stop the com line, I'm looking underneath and seeing, okay, is there much header loss here? And then I work my way back and see where the com line has spread uh, from the residue, from the residue spreaders and see where I'm at and how much loss is coming from the com line. So I try to deduct from the header and the com line, you know, is it the com line? Is it the header? And so then I'm looking at that. If I'm in corn, you know, I'm looking, if I'm spreading, have the spreaders down, it's two cur about two kernels per square foot equals about a bushel in acre loss. And if I'm in soybeans, it's almost four bu uh, four seeds in a square foot will equal one bushel an acre loss. So, you know, that's that's what I'm looking for. If I'm looking on the ground and looking at header loss, looking at combine loss and looking total loss, that's what I'm looking for. And, um, you know, it, it's you, I, I sometimes go by percentage. And, you know, if I have 200 and if I'm blessed with 250 bushel corn, and I see, uh, you know, two bushel an acre, I see, let's say I see four seeds in a square foot. I divide that out and I go by percentage. And so that's what I'm looking for is, you know, if I'm staying under one, one percent or less, I'm doing a pretty good job. So, and that's for both for corn and soybeans. In the time we have left, uh, let's go over to maintenance because that's something that, sure. uh, you know, you get busy and it's always yep. hard to want to stop and oil yep. and grease and so forth. I, I'm guessing you're going to tell me, well, follow whatever the manufacturer's recommendations are. Look at your manual and so forth. So I guess that is right. probably right. But any tips on what I should be doing and time of day? If people have all kinds of theories on, oh, don't do it early in the day. Wait until midday. Wait until the, your thoughts on yeah. when I should be oiling, greasing and so forth. Yeah, I thought, you, you bring up a good point. The oper operator's manual has some good, you know, good information. You know, first find it and then get it out and look at it. And uh, that's a, that's a good uh, point. And follow the recommendation, whether it's a hundred hours zerk or uh, three hundred hours zerk. Um, look and go by that, and then it'll tell you how many pumps, grease pumps you need for each uh, grease point. Um, if you know chains, you know looking at that. Is there a lot of wear? Look at the sprockets. Is there a, like kind of a oblong shape in the sprocket in the tooth? You tells me that you know there's a lot of wear there and perhaps replace the chain in the sprocket. Um, so it's really just looking at the chains, the belts, looking at the, 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 uh, drive belts. You know, if you, if you, uh, have a combine that has a feeder that's driven by a belt, then obviously look at that feeder drive belt. Um, you know, uh, you know, that just very basic stuff is looking at that to when they do it, I mean, that's before harvest. That's I, that's what I want I me mean, looking at is <laughs> I don't want to be stuck on in the field with a broken, when I should have looked at that, looked at that before harvest. That's very frustrating, but it's, it's good to get that stuff looked at before harvest and, um, you know, and, and daily checks, you know, look, washing the windows, you know, that's something that, you know, I've been in the wheat harvest run and that's something that's practice, you know, wash the windows, that's wash the mirrors so that you can see. Who's behind, if you're backing up, uh, then you want to make sure that you're, you're able to see. And, uh, uh one thing I'll, I should bring out is that, uh, before you even start, get the combine, if you haven't pulled the combine out and started harvesting yet, obviously is look, go crawl up in the engine deck and look in the, uh, engine area and see if there's any raccoons back there. For some reason, those raccoons really like to live around that engine area. I don't know what it is about that area. I wouldn't want to be in that area, but raccoons do. And so they, they, you know, make sure everybody, you know, take a look at that and make sure there's no raccoons before you start the engine. So. Yep, good point. We've, we've had those types of issues <laughs> sometimes right. ourselves. So, hey, Ryan, I know there's so much that we could visit about, but is there anything else that we haven't touched upon? Because you're dealing with this all the time, just other things that you'd want us to, to think about. Uh, when it comes to harvest. Yeah, I, I think just looking at the machine, you know, as far as maintenance goes and just making sure that, uh, you know, the basic settings, there's a lot, a lot on data, right? That's really a, a, a big thing is making sure that we capture the data and that it's correct. We don't, you know, you do all this, this work and effort to get and grow the crop and, and uh, we like to have the data. And, and so making sure that, we have a clean uh, flash card going into 
the display, uh, not from last year's, not using last year's data, but that we have a clean card um, uh, to save that data. Um, that's very important. And um, making sure that you have a backup, you know, making sure that's whether it's saved through the cloud or even on a flash drive onto your, onto your main computer, get that saved, that information saved. And, uh, you know, that's, that's an important thing. And, and uh, just basic settings, making sure that machine's going to run good. Uh, look at the ops manual, like we mentioned earlier, just making sure going through that the settings for rotor speed, fan speed, sieve settings, those are all, you know, per the ops manual. And, you know, you'll be off to a good start that way. And, and just being safe, right? I mean, it's whether you're working on the machine, whether it's you're working on the header or on the sick, replacing the sickler guard, you know, making sure that the feeder safety stand is down and, and you're aware of who's around the combine and, you know, it's good practice. If you're moving the machine, you jump in, walk the horn a few times so that everybody knows that you're moving the machine. So just think about those things. I think it's important. So, yeah. Ryan, all good tips. I really appreciate the time and hopefully everybody will have a, a good harvest. Yes, uh, safe harvest and uh, be blessed and yes, have a good, good time. Yes.